On today's edition of Mock Draft Monday right here on Lockdown Eagles, it's Mock versus Mock. Gino and I both went through a seven-round Philadelphia Eagles mock draft. Which one are you going to like better? I think it's going to be me. I think Gino would disagree, of course. We'll get into it coming your way right here on Lockdown Eagles. You are Locked On Eagles, your daily Philadelphia Eagles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We thank you so much for making Lockdown Eagles your first listen each and every day. Welcome in, Eagles fans, to a Monday edition of the show. Of course, as always, during draft season, Monday means it's Mock Draft Monday. We go through a seven-round Eagles Mock Draft every single week, but this time, you're being blessed with two Mock Drafts. Hopefully, you like both of them. I think you're going to like mine a little bit more, but we've been doing this for the last three years where we do a Mock versus Mock episode where I do a seven-round Eagles Mock Draft, Gino does one as well, and then you decide which one you hope would happen more for the Birds in just a few weeks for the 2024 NFL Draft. We thank you so much for making Lockdown Eagles your first listen today and every day. Today's episode is brought to you by GameTime. Download the GameTime app, create an account, use our code LOCKDOWNNFL for $20 off your first purchase. So yeah, we've been doing this for a few years now, and I think it's a fun exercise because again, Gino and I together try to go through so many different scenarios. What if the Eagles go for... Of course, what they do, a tackle. What if they trade up for a corner? What if they go against the grain compared to what they do historically and they take a linebacker or they trade down? What if they go for the luxury pick of a wide receiver or a tight end? Like We try to explore everything because the NFL draft is so unpredictable and the Eagles, you really never know what they're going to do. Some things are predictable, but other times you're like, wow, did not see that coming. That's why every single year it feels like Gino and I, when we do our live draft show, the reactions are crazy because... We didn't really expect them to do what they do. And so the other good part of why I like to do mock versus mock, though, is Gino and I do this together, but I think philosophically we do have some differences. I think there are times that, again, he sometimes will get the first round pick, and then I will, and he probably would do something different with that pick, and then I get the two second rounders, or he does. And so it's a good exercise to see if I was the general manager How would I approach this scenario? Same thing with Gino. So Gino's going to go through his seven-round mock draft in segment two. I'm going to kick things off with mine. And I'm not going to lie. I'm not just saying this because it's my mock draft. But if this scenario played out for the Eagles, I would be over the moon. I made two trades on day one and day two, two big trades combined. And I think I did a pretty good job of balancing out needs versus best player available, positional value, because again, during the NFL draft, like it's not black and white. You only draft best player available. You only draft for need. You only draft the trenches. Like I, I hate the black and white approach with the draft because every year is different. I think roster building always changes. Football is the most complicated sport in the world for a reason, and the draft just definitely reflects that for sure. So I'm going to share with you now my mock draft for the 2024 Mock versus Mock special right here on the Lockdown Eagles podcast. All right. So here it is, ladies and gentlemen, here is my mock draft and I love it. I love it. I don't know what Gino did yet as I'm recording this. I think there's been years where you like Gino's more. I think there's been a couple where you liked mine. I'm very confident in this one that you're going to be a big fan of it. So let's go through it. You can see it on the screen for our YouTube viewers, but I'm going to go through each pick. And of course, for our audio listeners, I got you. So The Eagles, of course, have the 22nd overall pick, but more times than not, general manager Howie Roseman likes to trade up, and that's something that I like to do in the draft as well. Four of the last five draft classes, Howie has moved up in the first round. As I've said a million times in the show, he barely ever stays put, and he's only traded down a few times on draft day. He's traded down a couple times overall, 2021, um, 2018 as well. So he's done that, but most of the time he likes to be aggressive, and even if it's not a 15-spot jump up the board, he likes to move up a little bit to go get his Andre Dillard or his you know, Jalen Carter or Devontae Smith after he moved down that year. He jumped right back up. It's not always the Carson Wentz move where he's moving up 20 spots up the board. So I took a page out of that blueprint, out of that playbook, and I went to get my guy. You guys all know my number one prospect for the Eagles in this draft, removing position, removing everything, is Toledo cornerback 
Quinion Mitchell. I made a trade with the Seattle Seahawks to get from 22 to pick 16. How did I do that? I traded the 120th pick this year in the fourth round. I also gave up the 171st pick on day three in the fifth round. And then I did give up a second round pick, but not this year. I kept 50 and 53. I gave Seattle a 2025 second rounder, which is, it was tough to do because next year is the first time in what, three to four years since the Carson Wentz trade that the Eagles really don't have a ton of draft capital where they have multiple picks in either or and or the first or second round. But I thought about that Hassan Reddick trade in 2026. They will be back with that flexibility of having multiple second or third round selections. Howie Roseman in the past has found ways to get second and third round picks through trades. And so I thought, I'm not saying I'm not going to get that pick back, but for now, let's be aggressive. Let's give up a future two to go get an immediate need, a future need, but it's also a position that is very valuable in the NFL right now at corner, and Kenyon Mitchell's style is all that more valuable at this spot because of his speed, his athleticism, his vision, his ball skills, his innate instincts to click and close. You know, he was more of a zone coverage corner at Toledo, but he showed at the Senior Bowl that he can play man. When you have that kind of athleticism, there's no reason to believe that he can't do it. Is he as physical as Terry and Arnold? Probably not. Is he as good of a tackler as Cooper DeGene? Probably not. But the overall skill set combined, Quinion Mitchell is the best corner in this class. He's my CB1, even over Arnold from Bama, Nate Wiggins from Clemson, all of them. So yeah, I give up a future too, but this is, it it just makes so much sense across the board for need, positional value, long-term and short-term desperation right now at corner. Are they desperate? Maybe not. I'm feeling more desperate than they are, but it's time to finally sit down and take a corner in the first round. So How did I recoup a second round pick though in 2025? As you can see on the screen for our YouTube viewers, I got the Cincinnati Bengals second round pick in 2025. Well, I recouped a second by trading down from the 50th pick to the 80th. So I got back in round three. We all know the Eagles traded their third in that Kenneth uh, Kenneth Pickett, Kenny Pickett trade. Um, So I got rid of 120 and that second next year. So with the Bengals, they offered me for the 50th overall pick They offered me 80 overall in round three and their second next year. So I'm like, absolutely. So now, basically to get Quinion Mitchell, all I did was move down from 50 to 80 and then I gave them a fourth and a fifth because I got that second round pick back in 2025 that I gave up to Seattle. So to me, this is like the best of both worlds and it's not ideal to not have both those picks in the second round, but for Quinion Mitchell, it's worth it. And I recoup a third round pick. So I made that trade with the Bengals. And then at 53, I got another my guy. It's Texas A&M linebacker, Edgerin Cooper. I'm becoming more of a fan of Devin White, the signing as the weeks have gone on. But I'm also not naive to the fact that he got benched last year, that he has not been close to that fifth overall prospect that he was when he was drafted by Tampa Bay or that 2020 all pro that helped them win a Super Bowl. Like, Devin White's on a one-year deal with very little guarantees, and N'Kobe Dean has barely played in the NFL. They're not a reason to not go after a linebacker of this skill set. Edron Cooper is physical. He's aggressive downhill. He can blitz. He can rush the passer off the edge. He's got really good ball skills. I believe he can be a three-down coverage linebacker with those development skills, You know, definitely warming up behind Dean and Devin White. Edron Cooper would probably start for this team over one of them. In my opinion, I think he would emerge as one of those best players. And I think the second round is normally a little rich for Philadelphia at this position, but they've never taken a corner in round one either. And they also don't normally sign running backs. This might be the year of zigging when the rest of the league is zagging. So I love Edron Cooper. He makes the most sense. And I think outside of corner linebacker might be your top need, both short term and and long-term. Is it as important as like a primary tackle to replace Lane, jo- Lane Johnson? Maybe not, but this is the draft for me. I want the Eagles to just pause their trenches philosophy and take care of some other positions long-term with cheap, inexpensive rookie deals. So then again, I moved down from 50 to 80. Round three, it's time to get this 12 personnel package back to a pass-friendly, respectable unit. Since Zach Ertz has left, they have not had that. And Jatavion Sanders from Texas, who normally has been in these mock drafts, evaluated as a second-round prospect, he fell to 80. And I could actually see that because Sanders was seen as 
the consensus tight end two behind Brock Bowers for the majority of draft season, but he did not test very well at the combine. And I think that, again, should it be a reason he plummets down the board? No, absolutely not. His film does the talking, but Jatavion Sanders, I could see him being a third round pick. It's not a great tight end class. People might prefer Theo Johnson from Penn State or um, the kid from Kansas State, uh, Ben Sennett. Who knows? So I really like Jatavian Sanders. It's great value here. And not only do you need a 12 personnel package this year, and you don't really have a true wide receiver three right now, but also Dallas Scotter, like long term, who knows how much longer he's going to be a, a top tier tight end. This again was the same age that Goddard is now that Ertz was when they drafted Dallas in the second round. So I was over the moon to find Jatavian Sanders available there at pick 80. Then I went back to the trenches finally, but again, I'm not looking for that Lane Johnson replacement right now. I think he's got another year or two left in him before he retires, so I don't want to burn two years of a rookie deal on a Tyler Guyton or a first-round prospect. I'll replace Lane when the time comes. Right now, I'm focused more for the offensive line on getting another primary, versatile backup for Jeff Stoutland to develop, and that's Caden Wallace from Penn State. Is his ceiling as high as some of, some of these other guys? Maybe not, but he has tackle guard versatility. That's very important considering Tyler Steen's an unproven right guard right now. Lane Johnson, if he goes down, you don't really have a true confident backup. Caden Wallace can be that tweener, maybe your new Halapuli Vadi Vitae in the fifth round at pick 161. And then another my guy for Lou DiBiase, not too surprising, but two-lane slot receiver, Jaquan Jackson, who the Eagles, actually the reports are, really like, and he has visited the NovaCare complex. Jaquan Jackson, then if you get him, you can have a slot by committee approach. He's a true, like, shifty, traditional slot receiver, explosive but undersized, very smooth in and out of his breaks. You've got the big guy in Devontae Parker. You've got the 4-3 speed guy in Paris Campbell. I really like that pick at 172. And then I wrap things up with Utah safety, a versatile player, and Sion Vakai can also be a special teams monster for Mike Clay. Vakai was somebody that caught my eye at the Senior Bowl. The Eagles don't really need safety as much now with Chauncey Garner-Johnson locked up and Reed Blankenship and Sidney Brown, but Sidney Brown might not be ready for the season. They need depth outside of those three because they want to run a lot of safety-heavy packages on defense and you need special teamers. Vakai was a very reliable player. Him and Cole Bishop, underrated players coming out of Utah in that defensive backfield. So there's my, those are my picks. Six players, made some trades, but overall I'm happy with it. I move up for Quinion Mitchell, get the CB1 of the future, get a athletic monster at linebacker at Edrin Cooper, maybe your Dallas Goddard replacement long-term and Jatavion Sanders. If not, just a great 12 personnel package now that's respectable compared to when you had Jack Stahl, a versatile lineman in Caden Walls from Penn State, a slot receiver in Jaquan Jackson from Tulane, and then a special team safety, Sion Bakai from Utah. And I got that second round pick back in 2025 with the Cincinnati Bengals. So there you have it. There is Lou DiBiase's 2024 mock draft for mock versus mock right here on the Locked On Eagles podcast. Coming up next, it's going to be Gino Camilleri's mock draft. What is Gino going to do with his picks. Really excited to get into that coming your way. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Today's episode of the Lockdown Eagles podcast is brought to you by Game Time. Game Time is now an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets even faster and easier than it already was. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch. That normally does not happen. With killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets. Save up to 60% off buying last minutes of sport tickets, concerts, comedy, theater, everything. That's going on. Save even more with exclusive in-app deals on select seats ahead of the game or the event. Get a panoramic view from your seat in the app before you buy so you know you're not only getting a great price but the perfect view. Your purchase is covered with the most flexible customer service policy in the ticketing industry. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the app. Create an account. Use our code LOCKDOWNNFL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms do apply. Again, create an account, redeem that code locked on for $20 off. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price, guarantee. 
Ladies and gentlemen, are you watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day? Got to turn down the volume with all that shouting. Make the switch to Locked On Sports today. It's a free 24-7 sports streaming channel program for you every day to bring you the biggest stories. Without all the screaming, Locked On Sports today brings you can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, everyone? GM, GC, Gino Camilleri here, host of the Locked On Eagles podcast, sitting in the driver's seat, playing the role of Howie Roseman, going up for year seven of Mock versus Mock against Lou DiBiase, my co-host. I don't know what he did. You can vote. Tell us where we went right, where we went wrong, what mock draft you would prefer. Let's get right into it without any further ado. Those listening along, I'm going to explain every pick, every trade. Those watching on YouTube, I will have the board up with all of the picks live as we go through this. So let's get rolling. The Philadelphia Eagles folks are just a couple weeks from making their pick. So how I started this thing off the board, it goes pretty standard. Caleb Williams, Drake May, Jaden Daniels, Marvin Harrison Jr., Joe Alt, Malik Neighbors, Olu Fashanu, Laatu Latu, J.J. McCarthy, Roma Dunze, Terry and Arnold, Dallas Turner, Troy Fautanu, Tylese Fuaga, Brock Bowers, Kenyon Mitchell, J.C. Latham, Brian Thomas, Jared Verse, Cooper DeJean, and our Marius Mims. So I'm sitting there at the 22nd pick. Ring, ring, ring. The Minnesota Vikings, who are picking at 23, decided that, hey, they want to make a trade. What do they want to make a trade for? They want to come up and get a quarterback. Well, guess what? You're going to have to pay a premium. So to move up one spot, Minnesota was willing to give us the 23rd pick, pick 108 in the fourth round, and an additional 2025 fourth round pick in next year's draft. This trade to me is very reminiscent of that Jalen Carter trade, of the Jordan Davis trade, where you're trading back-end picks to move up one or two selections. That's what Minnesota wants to do. And for a quarterback, they're going to have to pay a premium. And to move down one spot, there's still some guys on the board that I was in love with. Chop Robinson, you could have made the argument that if you traded down far enough, you could have taken either Kingsley Suamatia or Tyler Guyton on the offensive line. I was sitting there saying Nate Wiggins is there you know that Minnesota is going to want to come up and get a quarterback at pick 23. I selected cornerback out of Clemson, Nate Wiggins. And why was that? I think there's a top tier of cornerbacks. And then there's a tier just below it. The top two is Kenyon Mitchell, Terry and Arnold one, a one B right below that is Nate Wiggins. I think he stands alone just above Kool-Aid McKinstry, in my opinion. And for the Eagles, Cooper DeGene, great player. Very, very good player. I think the Eagles have a lot of what he does, though, in terms of the middle of the field defending-wise. Nate Wiggins, they don't have that athleticism on the outside. Say what you want about his run defense. I've seen enough clips that he's willing and able to be a run tackler on the outside. What I don't want to see is guys who are on the outside that just get burned like James Bradbury time and time and time again. You bring in Nate Wiggins, you allow him to go and develop in that room, challenge Keely Ringo, challenge some of those younger guys. And at the same time, you added a couple picks to go along with this thing. So we move back from 22 to 23, and we make that pick of Nate Wiggins. Once again, we move back one spot to acquire 23, where we took Nate Wiggins. We added pick 108 and a 2025 Minnesota fourth round pick moving on to round two. So we know that we were going to have the 50th and 53rd selection here. So as we continue to roll on some of the big names that you're looking at, could you potentially add an edge rusher and a Deza Isaac? He goes to Tennessee. Could you make you the argument that in round two, Tyler Newbin didn't test well, but could still be the best safety on some people's boards. Would you want to trade up for Xavier worthy? Ennis Rakestraw is out there. Max Melton as well. Well, you already went out and got your cornerback. I don't think you have to worry about that position. So you just kind of let the board fall to you. And as it kept falling, the linebackers kind of sat there. 
And I'm saying, okay, if I have to move up and strike for Edrian Cooper, I think I'm within striking range, especially with what you got from that Minnesota trade. You have enough to go and go up. Well, there started to be a little bit of run on the cornerbacks. Kamari Lasseter, Ennis Rakestraw, Max Milton, Lad McConkey, he goes, Zach Frazier goes. And then all of a sudden, Edrian Cooper is just sitting there. He's sitting there waiting for me to pick him at pick 50. Do I believe he will be there at pick 50? Fingers crossed. But if he is, you make that pick all day, Howie Roseman. You run to the table to turn in that selection. I know it won't be Howie Roseman. It'll be a runner that then t- calls it in to somebody at the table. The table then runs it to somebody else, who then gives it to Roger Goodell, whoever is making the calls that day. You know how it goes. But go and get Edrin Cooper. He's an athlete playing linebacker. You teach him how to play linebacker. You need athletes in the secondary. What did you get with those first two picks? Nate Wiggins is an elite athlete when it comes to his long speed, his ability to move in short areas, his foot speed as well. Edger and Cooper, man, off-ball linebackers, it seems to be a dying breed these days. He truly could come in here and provide you an element that Devin White and Kobe Dean aren't going to give you. Devin White's really, really good when it comes to that athleticism element. When it comes to his play, there's a lot to be desired. Nicobe Dean, a little bit undersized. Is he a top-level athlete? I wouldn't say that, but does he have good production when he's in there? 100%. Edrian Cooper, he's a mix of all of those things. You teach him to play football, and you could walk away with a heck of a pick there at pick 50. So as we continue to go, we have pick 53. Two more picks went before that. Leonard Taylor the third, Bo Brady the safety out of Maryland. If you've noticed, we haven't picked offensive line yet. We've said on Lockdown Eagles time and time and time and time and time again that we think and we believe and we know the Eagles love to target offensive linemen in that second round territory. Now, there's a lot of guys in that interior that are worthy of that selection. Cooper Beebe is out there. You can make that pick. You can make the Christian Mahogany pick out of Boston College, but there's one offensive tackle who definitely raw, definitely a big brooding tackle that can use some polish, but man, the tape is fun to watch because he just absolutely dogs people when he's flying off the line. Patrick Paul, offensive tackle out of Houston. You don't get that top tier, the top five offensive tackles. Heck, you don't even get like the Kingsley Sua Matias, the Tyler Guytons of the world. But man, Patrick Paul is in that next range of the next guy up when it comes to the offensive line. And he's got the size. He's got the strength. Can he be molded? 100%. Jeff Stoutland is your offensive line coach. Absolutely. You sit there, you wait for the offensive lineman to fall to you after that 50th pick. Could you have made the argument that they could have made the selection? Definitely so. But with Edrian Cooper being there, I think he's a tier above anybody else on your board at that time. You make that pick, you go and get Patrick Paul, and through three picks, you've addressed three areas of need. Cornerback, linebacker, and offensive tackle. Now, linebacker is a much more immediate need than I would say corner and offensive line. But cornerback, he's going to be in a rotation right away. Patrick Paul, he's potentially going to be your next man up off the bench on that right side. Leave Fred Johnson on the left side of that line. And he could potentially take Lane Johnson's job in a couple years when Lane retires. So through three picks, you go corner, linebacker, offensive line. Went with two picks that I wanted and one that the Eagles, of course, are going to do with the offensive line. We move into round three. We keep it rolling here. As we know, there's going to be a little bit of a lull between those picks. After you trade back, you got to wait until the fourth round until you make a selection. I didn't make any trades to go up. Howie Roseman, though, you think he's going to sit there in the third round and not want to go and do something? Especially if he acquires more ammo from Minnesota in that trade that we made earlier. Yeah, he's going to make some sort of move to go up and try and get his guy. So as we go into the fourth round, we're waiting at pick 110. Oh, just kidding. We're at pick 108. How did we get there? Through the Minnesota trade. Once again, we receive a call. It's from the Chargers. They say, hey, we'll give you pick 
110 and 181 for pick 108 and 210. So we go up two spots, give up a seventh, pick up a sixth rounder. I love the idea. Let's go and do it. They move up. They take offensive lineman Blake Fisher. Probably would have been my selection if we didn't make that pick and Patrick Paul right before that. Then off the board, after Blake Fisher comes Kalen King. And sitting there is my arguably top safety in this class. One of my favorites to watch. When you think Gino Camilleri safety, think of this guy, Malik Mustafa, Wake Forest, comes downhill like a bat out of hell. It's not a deep safety class, but you can make the argument that Malik Mustafa might be the best of this group. He's the best athlete out of this group. His tape, it might not look as good as somebody like Tyler Newbin, for example. Might not look as good as some of the other safeties that you might prefer. But I prefer Malik Mustafa. I think it's a steal here at pick 110. I think he's a round three player all day long. You move back, pick up another six-round pick by giving up a seventh as well. I think it's a very smart move. You add Malik Mustafa. You don't have to worry about adding any more safeties to that room. And heck, your secondary and the back half of that defense, it's looking pretty good. So we went for the offensive line, but we haven't went for any offensive weapons yet. So as we move on, we're thinking, okay, maybe Jalen Wright, the blazing running back out of Tennessee, could he be the pick? Add a little lightning to the thunder with Saquon, maybe Dylan Lauba, the running back out of New Hampshire, very good receiving back. No. There was one tight end on that board who it felt too good to be true once again. But Theo Johnson, the tight end out of Penn State, you talk about a lethal one-two pairing with him and Dallas Goddard. Goodness gracious. I won't go on too long. I've talked about the idea of adding a number two to open up 12 personnel to make this offense that much more or that much less one-dimensional, rather, where it's just through the two wide receivers and Dallas Goddard. You're now going to add a potential high-quality fifth weapon in a guy like Theo Johnson to add with Saquon Barkley as well. So we continue to roll on into round five. We get to picks 161 now. This is our selection. We're sitting there. It's pretty wide open what we can do. I think we've done a good job addressing needs so far. Cornerbacks, safeties, linebackers. You grab offensive line talent. You add a tight end too. This one might be like a best player available at a position that you already have a lot of players. Gabe Hall, the defensive tackle out of Baylor. You talk about, one, a freak athlete. Two, a position that you lose Fletcher Cox. You could potentially lose Milton Williams after this season. Jordan Davis, is he going to add anything to that pass rushing element that you have? We still have to wait to see what Marlon Tui Pelotu and Moro Ajomo ultimately become. Gabe Hall, add him to that rotation, man. If you watch that senior bowl tape, he has one really, really good move, that arm over, but he beat just about everybody with it at the senior bowl. How he loves to invest in the trenches, can make the argument you take an edge. Well, that might be a little teaser, but there we grab Gabe Hall at pick 161. Next up, picks 171 and 172. I did a double dip here. I went with two edge rushers. Muhammad Kamara at pick 171, the edge out of Colorado State, and then adding Miles Cole, the edge out of Texas Tech. This is a conversation that can go back and forth when it comes to the edge position. Do you want to invest high, go get one of those guys and say, okay, we have what we need for the future? Or do you believe what you already have there in that building with Bryce Hoff, Josh Sweat, Nolan Smith? is enough, and you just want to add back-end players that can develop based on their athleticism, based on their traits. Let's double dip. You had Mo Kamara, not a better athlete than Miles Cole, but has that production. Go watch the Colorado tape. Single-handedly kept CSU in that game. Miles Cole, freak athlete, freak size, freak athleticism, off-ball linebacker, edge rusher. What is he? He's a football player. You go and develop that size. You double dip at that position. And in this round, in round five, you just added three guys on the defensive line and they might come in right away and be legitimate rotational players for you. So we're on to round six, the last pick here for me. And you're probably saying, how do we get here? Well, let's remind you 
At pick 108, we moved back with the Chargers to pick 110, and we also acquired pick 181 while swapping pick 210. So at pick 181, I'm going to do a double, another double dip. Say that 20 times fast. This one, I am going with somebody who takes a route that ended up seeing him play professional football before he even got drafted to the National Football League. With this pick, I went with somebody who already played pro football, cornerback Quantez Stiggers, out of the Toronto Argonauts, north of the border. He's somebody that the NFL, they like. He was at the Shrine Bowl, got an invitation. Scouts wanted to see him. Has the size, has the athleticism, has the ability to play press man. He's got to play on a condensed field, though, as opposed to the CFL. So after the Stiggers pick, we wrap things up. Let's take a look back at pick 23 after we made that trade to move down from pick 22 with Minnesota by acquiring pick 108 and a 2025 fourth round pick. We had cornerback Nate Wiggins out of Clemson. We then add linebacker Edrian Cooper out of Texas A&M at pick 50. Offensive tackle Patrick Paul out of Houston at pick 53. Then we go to pick 110, which we acquired by moving pick 108 with the Chargers and swapped that seventh round selection to go up and get pick 181 as well. We draft safety Malik Mustafa out of Wake Forest. Then at pick 120, we add Theo Johnson, the Penn State tight end. We go and get Gabe Hall, Muhammad Kamara, and Miles Cole all on the defensive line in the sixth round. And then we move and we get another pick. Excuse me, that was the fifth round. And then we add in the sixth round, Quantez Stiggers, cornerback out of Toronto. Add somebody north of the border, somebody who played high-profile football already in big-time minutes. That'll do it for me, Gino Camilleri. Let me know what you think about my mock versus mock. Today's episode of the Lockdown Eagles podcast is brought to you by BetterHelp Online Therapy. A lot of us spend our lives wishing that we had more time. I think we all do that. The question is, time for what? For me, it's doing mock drafts and podcasting. If time was unlimited, how would you use it? The best way to squeeze that special thing into your schedule is to know what's in important to you and to make it a priority. Therapy can help you find what matters to you so you can do more of it. If you're thinking of starting therapy, trust me, give BetterHelp a try. I've been doing it for a few years now and it really has changed my life and the perspective I take on my life. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Whether you're working the morning shift, the graveyard, BetterHelp is there and flexible. Just fill out a brief questionnaire, get matched with a licensed therapist. And speaking of flexible, you can switch your therapist at any time for no additional charge. Sometimes it takes a few to find the right fit for you. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOn today. You're going to get 10% off your first month. Again, that's BetterHelp.com slash LockedOn for 10% off your first month of online therapy. All right, Eagles fans, we're wrapping up this Monday edition of the Locked On Eagles podcast. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. A lot of fun. Gino and I love to do mock versus mock every single year on the pod. I like Gino's mock draft a lot, actually. I normally do, but I I like mine. I don't know. I mean, of course, I'm biased. This Again, the cool thing about these drafts were neither one of us was trying to pander. I don't think either one of us were trying to take the perspective of what would Howie Roseman do. It was simply... Gino Camilleri is the Philadelphia Eagles general manager. What would he do if this scenario played out? Same with me. What would I do? And I thought we took kind of some similar approaches, but also we definitely have some differences. And that's why I like to do this exercise um, every single year for sure. And for Howie Roseman, I think it's a, it's a big draft. Is it like one of his most important of his career? No, like that was 2016 getting Carson Wentz. It was putting his neck on the line, getting Jalen Hurts in 2020 and then 2021 and 2022 the decisions at quarterback and you know taking receivers and starting to build that core like those were very important drafts for not only his job security but the future of this football team this year I feel like their roster right now looks pretty good on both sides of the ball with young talent with prime players with veterans at very important spots like the Eagles are going to be a unit this year I think truly they will bounce back from that collapse last year but it does kind of feel like a reputation draft almost a little bit for Howie when you look at it in this way. Like Howie Roseman for a long time, we've all known Howie's strengths. Like we know he's very open-minded, willing to change his philosophy. I think he's a great trader. He understands value. He's very in tune with the league, 
what's going on, what players are available. He's aggressive. He's good at zigging when the rest of the league zags, like finding market inefficiencies. Like he is very good at a lot of things, but even when he had his comeback after 2016 and he won a Super Bowl, even when he won that title, it wasn't really because he was a great drafter. Like that was always his Achilles heel is how he was never really great at Again, I think he was good at trading during the draft and moving up and down the board. And I just think the execution of the player he actually normally took, it didn't work out a lot of the times. And then over the last three years, he's kind of worked his way out of that reputation. And now we've respected what he's done in the draft. And I think maybe some of that's because he has just made it easier by taking Alabama players and Georgia players. Feels like can't miss guys. Devontae Smith and you know you look at Jalen Carter and trading a first for AJ Brown I think he has simplified his approach but you got to give him credit for that right I think sometimes he was trying to be the smartest guy in the room and trying to just always take small school players or you know just different styles of guys like Jalen Rager over Justin Jefferson like he's, he did that a lot and I think him making it simpler and just taking studs I think you got to give him credit for that because that's not something that he always did. And a lot of times teams in the league don't always keep it that simple. And it really isn't just that simple um, because there's players at top schools that produce and that look like they have all the traits in the world that don't pan out. It's always unpredictable what happens in a draft, but how he's kind of turned things around the last three years. I mean, the jury's still out on some guys like Nolan Smith and Jordan Davis and Kobe Dean, but overall, comparatively speaking to some of the classes he had, like, you look at 2019 and you look at 2020, you look at 2017, like it, they weren't great. They were pretty brutal. And year after year, he had to rely on veterans and finding young players through other avenues like day three, which he was always great at drafting day three guys because he early on in drafts, he was, he was missing a lot. Now it's kind of the opposite. But the reason I, I digress, the reason he, this is kind of a reputation draft is because when Howie did struggle, early in drafts, it was normally when he had picks like he does now from like 20 to 32, like that 22nd overall pick. Again, not to discredit Howie, but it's easier to get a Jalen Carter to hit at nine overall or Devontae Smith inside the top 15 than it is going for a prospect from 20 to 32. It's why a lot of teams sometimes choose to move down. It's just harder and prospects. I think the gap closes in and I think that's where you got the Andre Dillards of the world and the Jalen Ragers and the Marcus Smiths and even like the Derek Barnetts. And so not to say that every single one of those guys was a flop, but most of them were. This is normally an area that Howie struggles with. So we'll see if the past three years, if this is truly who he is now, if he is just a good drafter and he's kind of completed that evolution of who he is as a GM or if he kind of re results back to uh, old ways, we'll see. But it's a, it's a big draft, and having picked 22, that's not an easy spot to be in, especially in a class like this that's weird. It, it feels weird. Like, we don't know. We know there's going to be an offensive run, but, you know, what positions are going to be available, and if there's a run on corner and tackle, are there guys at other positions worth it? Like, there's not really a lot of linebackers and safeties and, you know, defensive tackles worth this pick, so... I think he's going to be aggressive and try to trade up so he doesn't have to pick at 22, but it's uh, it's a big draft for him because this is normally a pick that he doesn't really do well with. So, And I expect him to not want to sit there for that reason because it's it's hard to, to nail even a first-round pick sometimes later on in day one. So we'll see what happens. Can, going to continue our draft coverage for the next few weeks, just spamming you with prospect talk. We'll continue that Tuesday through Friday this week. We thank you so much for making Lockdown Eagles your first listen each and every day. Let us know who won Mock versus Mock. Hit us up on Twitter, at Lockdown Birds. I will post both mock drafts uh, in a few days this week once everybody takes time to watch and listen to the show. I'll put up a poll for you guys to vote. But if you watch the, or listen to the show and Comment on YouTube, hit us up on Twitter, at DiBiase, L-O-E, at GC24 underscore football as well. Let us know who won the 2024 edition of Mock versus Mock. For my co-host, Gino Camilleri, I'm Lou DiBiase signing off. As always, thank you so much for downloading, watching, and listening to Lockdown Eagles. Fly, Eagles, fly. Let's go, birds.